we're giving them data and they're not giving us anything. And their 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 fuel is is our data. And I think we're starting to you know play with fire right now. The Surgeon General, um, who's we also use a clip of that from the film, you know, has deemed loneliness as you know one of the major um, epidemics in in our current society. The cost of convenience. What are the hidden costs of the digitization of the world over the last 50 years? What are some of the consequences that we're experiencing in society within our culture right now, particularly within the Western developed world, as a result of these technologies and social media? We're seeing politicization. We're seeing the impact on our human rights. We're seeing uh, the impact on our mental health. There's so many dynamics to this equation, unforeseen uh, consequences alongside some of the benefits these technologies have have, have delivered. So we're here today talking with David Donnelly, who's an American filmmaker, who's been exploring these issues in real depth with his latest production. Really excited to have this conversation today. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cutting topic right now. It's top of the mind for a lot of people. So David, welcome to the Free Humanity Podcast. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Now, first of all, I just want to ask you, you know, you've got a, a rich history in terms of the types of content that you've created through your, your filmmaking work. But there's a, it feels like there's a kind of a turn in a different direction here. You've launched CultureNet. This is looking at, you know, real deep social issue from looking at music and the role of um, creativity and art in our culture. This takes a different look. What inspired you to create this piece of work? Um, I think uh, the, the big realization is that, um, you know, we're living through something that uh, I think is, is going to be eventually compared to a major revolution in history. You know, whether that you look at the industrial revolution or you look at how the printing press, inf you know, influenced civilization, you know, all, having access to all this information through the internet and having all this power shift internet platforms um, has happened so fast that I just don't think we've had a, we're still kind of processing um, what's happening. And, and as a result of that, um, you know, instead of looking um, like with classical music, I was just really interested because, you know, I felt really connected to be able to, it, it kind of forced me to take a step back and look at things in a, in a bigger way and being, you know, transported back to these different periods of time, as well as to, you know, contemporary classical as well. But I got, especially during the pandemic, I got, um, I, all of our shoots kind of got shut down. And, you know, um, during that period of time, I started to really look at, how technology was impacting us and became really curious about the impact of, of technology as well as the merger of technology and culture. And so that kind of led me in this direction of um, initially what we thought was going to be about technology addiction. And then throughout the process, we just realized that was just the beginning. You know, that was just a symptom of this deep root cause. And that's what we spent two years exploring in the cost of convenience. Wow. Um, well, on that, is, it, was there a turning point in the kind of production where there was a kind of insight into into the kind of broader consequences of this technology set? Yeah, I I think you know we we started off going to one of our first shoots was in Seattle um, at a, a really amazing facility called Restart, um, where they focus on technology addiction, and it's kind of like a rehab facility for people that have you know tech addiction problems. It's on this beautiful farm. Um, you know, you're not allowed to have cell phones or any kind of devices. And I mean, first of all, I was just blown away by how much of a problem this was. And, you know, that was kind of a, a major realization. But then we started looking at the solutions and, you know, it, it's it's kind of at first it felt a little bit hopeless in that. Well, you know, how how as individuals can we possibly, you know, compete against kind of this David and Goliath story of these massive Internet platforms that now we depend upon for virtually every aspect of our, you know, existence in, in modern culture. And, and so really when we interviewed Roger McNamee, um, that really opened the door to help us get to the root cause. And, you know, I had a, a really intense phone call with him, kind of a pre-screen of the interview before then. And he just stressed the importance of not making this about strictly technology addiction because um, it's, it's misleading in that that's really just the, the symptom to a larger problem. And if we really want to solve the problem um, and get ahead of it, you know, we have to go to the top. And instead of the individual, we have to look at the power structure. Um, and Carissa also talks a lot about that as well. Um, Carissa Valise, who's, um, you know, a associate professor of artificial intelligence ethics at Oxford, who wrote a great book called Privacy is Power. Um, and it really those power dynamics is, is what we started to realize 
um, it, it, it's, it's, it's the focus of this. And so yeah, in, in, some, like, in some ways it's like an age old story, just, you know, with the new, you know, new paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I concur with that. And I'd like to explore some of the power structure elements more as we go into this because of the, um, the various dynamics that that plays out across, you know, the erosion of our privacy, human rights and, and more. Um, but I want to just center upon the, the title of the film. And I've got a, 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 you know, one of the quotes from the opening of the film, which is um, from Roger, who you mentioned, for every technological advancement, our lives become a little more convenient. But there is a cost to that convenience. That cost is sometimes hidden and is always greater than the benefit. But from producing this film, what do you see now as some of those broader costs that we are facing as a result of these technology sets? If it's beyond that technological addiction, which you, 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 I think you rightly identify as a symptom, what, what do you see as some of those broader and deeper uh, well, costs? You know, Roger has another great quote in the film, which is that, um, you know, it certainly has made, uh, in general, internet platforms have made some things better, but there's not a single existential problem that we face that it hasn't made worse. And so I think whether that's the polarization politically, um, I think it, it can go to misinformation. It can go to, um, uh, in general, just the, the, the tribalism that's occurring, especially in the United States, but also elsewhere. Um, mental health, suicide and depression are on the rise. Um, I mean, it's despite all of these advances, I mean, there's still a lot of, um, I mean, mental health, health is, is very much um, a, a major problem and, and worry for, for teens and, and for kids in general in the United States and elsewhere. But the Surgeon General, um, who's, we also use a clip of that from the film, you know, has deemed loneliness as, you know, one of the major um, epidemics in, in our current society. And that's just, it's, it's crazy to me because the whole premise of a lot of these platforms was to connect people. And, and so, you know, the, the reality is what are the costs? You know, we, we're, we don't know the cost. That's the problem is that it, we're moving ahead before we actually can evaluate the consequences. And now with AI, it's just kind of like throwing gasoline on that fire. Um, that's not to say that there's not huge benefits. I mean, you know, if you have cancer right now and, you know, it, it's kind of a hopeful time in that there's lots of, of data that's being collected and lots of treatments that are available with the same technologies that are causing problems. But you know, we've been brainwashed from a very young age just to think that, you know, the technology is so magical and that all these advancements are kind of essential to our happiness. And so we're talking about a multi-billion dollar marketing machine that, you know, we've been having to deal with uh, from very young ages, but the costs have no marketing machine. <laughs> there is nobody that's talking about those. And it's only after times, like when there's a leak within Facebook that reveals that, you know, they knew about how Instagram was harming, particularly young women's health, mental health. Um, they had that information and it wasn't until that comes out to realize that, well, those are the costs, but these are private companies. I mean, they're publicly traded, but um, with, within there, it's not like we necessarily have access to a, a lot of that data. Um, and, and in fact, it's our data that is what is allowing them to you know, reach these these pinnacles of, you know, economic growth that are just, you know, I, I mean, un, unimaginable um, uh, um, amount of, of, of influence um, that, that these, these companies have. Well, yeah, that level of influence is something that I, I'm deeply concerned about. You mentioned polarization and division, and I don't recall a time in my adult life, I turned 40 last year, and I don't recall, recall a point in my adult uh, time that that we, we live in such a divided world. And this, to me, the social media algorithms are, are configured in order to create sensationalized opposites of the same story. And it just puts people into camps. You're, you're either on team, uh, I support the current thing, or you're on the team, I'm against the current thing. And that seems to play out for almost every single issue. And, and as a result, you've got almost like digital civil war on some of the platforms. And it's... Well, the, the, uh, the, the, the analogy that I like to use is Imagine getting a license. I mean, especially in the UK, you know, which is like a, a big deal to get a driver's license, right? Um, you have to take an exam. You have to sit with somebody. They have to see how you drive. You have to understand how the signals work. There's all of the signage everywhere. And, and why is it? It's because vehicles are a tool, but they also are very dangerous. You know, there are several tons worth of heaps of aluminum and metal that can harm people. 
And so we require a license and some sense of education so that people have a manual on how to operate this tool, right? And yet, if you use the same logic, there it doesn't exist when it comes to internet platforms and cell phones in general. And we're, we're giving these to everybody and we're incentivizing people to, to use them. And so it's not that the tool itself is bad or good, but if you look at the incentive model, it is not incentivized to help you or to keep you healthy or to connect you with people. Um, that's just, that's not, you know, I, I mean, some, some, not, that's not to say everybody, you know, there are some really great um, internet platforms and companies out there. So I'm not trying to just throw a blanket, but in general, people just need to have a basic understanding of how these things work. Just like you need a license to get into a vehicle. You know, you should have some sense of essential education on how these things function. Data privacy, polarization, um, you should understand how algorithms work, the possible discriminatory effects that that, that causes. Um, you know, once you get a general grip on this, at, at least you have some sense of knowledge that you can arm yourself with when you engage with them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a really important point. You, you know, you, you could say the technology is inert or neutral, but it's the, the intention is created by the incentive structures and the incentive structure is, uh, structure is to favor the bottom line. It's to maximize growth. It's maximize your attention. It's maximize the time you spend on the platforms. And as a result, it learns as much as it possibly can about you, your preferences, your behaviors. And, you know, many people say that social media can predict your behaviors better than you, you can yourself now because of the, the, the level of information that is, is held. Now, at what cost is the question. And, and I think this is an important point because these companies now wield incredible power to, to influence opinion, to influence political matters, to, you know, we've just been through a pandemic with kind of information war through that period of time. The level of power that these organizations have over our life. And I think when we think of the kind of major social platforms, people, people think about the Facebooks, the Instagrams, the Twitter or X and, and various others, particularly in the Western world, but the, the line is now bl blurred between, you know, the, the old days of the startup when they were cutting edge and they were doing something new and now becoming highly influential in our day to day lives. And again, I've spoken with people like Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi, and they're looking at the, 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 the merger in a way of state and big tech. And this brings up all kinds of other issues which can further impinge on our human rights. What, what do you think specifically? is the, the real problem when it comes to the size and impact of these organizations now? Well, I just, I think the starting point has to be about um, the, the sharing of um, understanding how these platforms work. I mean, I think it, it, it's almost like there needs to be a, an international, you know, and in Europe, it, there's a lot of companies and a lot of governments in the EU that are already starting to, to do this. But especially in America, we need a, a PSA campaign, you know, public service announcement. To where it's just getting people to understand these basic elements of some of the things that we're discussing of how they work that your interaction with these platforms can determine what kind of of mortgage that you get what kind of loan that you get from a bank they can determine who your life partner might ultimately be they can determine what kind of jobs that you might end up applying for um and you know you might not even and, and they what you buy uh, you know, who you follow, what your political beliefs are. Um, it's, it's also another cost that I think we're, it's no secret now, but it was for, for several years, this kind of blew up as we were making the film, but, um, this is now a new form of cyber warfare, um, between nations, you know, I mean, what greater way than to get inside of, um, you know, a, a nation's head than to, you know, slowly, uh, release different forms of content that might persuade them to have certain types of thinking that might be anti-democratic. Um, we've seen this with TikTok. We know that this was happening. We know that there's these connections with these different governments that are trying to, um, in some ways, brainwash you know our, our kids. And these things are really happening. Um, but because everything has become so digitized, it doesn't feel like it's really happening. So we're still our our you know our our primal brains are still very much adjusting to the digitization of, of, of being human. And so this massive revolution that we're living through, um, that distance between the realization of the costs and those costs incurring, that gap is what we're trying to close. Um, because you know, the, the amount that 
the speed at which the change is occurring is is hard to is, is just it's it's, ex, it's existential. Um, I'm sorry, exponential. So you know the the analogy that we the that we use for that is that in the '60s, um, you know when we went to the moon, uh, the computer uh, strength that they had was just a couple, you know, thousand transistors, um, on the Apollo spacecraft that got astronauts to the moon. I mean, they were still using notepads to do some of these <laughs> mathematics. Um, the iPhone that people have in their pockets is, um, so much stronger, you know, uh, millions of times stronger than what the astronauts used to get to the moon. And that power you know, requires some basic understanding of how it works. And that's what we're, we're lacking. I mean, imagine knowing that the device that you have in your pocket was stronger than the most advanced technology in the 60s that allowed human civilization to go to the moon for the first time. You don't realize that, you know, we're kind of casually just, you know, nonchalantly using these and engaging with the devices that are on there without really respecting the amount of, of, of power that these devices hold over our lives. Yeah, I mean, it, as you say, it's growing expon exponentially, and you know, the, the fraudulent slip on existential. I think you know yeah. there, there is potential yes. existential risks with it as well. I mean, a AI now, you know, the possibly, you know, there's some with deep fakes, you know, and particularly in the context of politicization. To, to me, it doesn't seem like we're far off, or it's already happening between having a, you know, blue team AI and a red team AI. That I don't care what you know side of the political equation someone lives on, but this is dangerous you know people's ability to discern what is human created what is manufactured by machine what is bot generated what is even you know defense agencies creating content as you mentioned as a kind of form of geopolitical uh espionage you know it's it's there's all kinds of use cases that we just simply even if we have the tools to discern it's becoming so sophisticated that well the risks are profound and, and you know this is just the beginning but you know you mentioned how fast social technologies have grown why well, ai is growing even faster it's unbelievable yeah i don't know if you watched the um uh, putin's address to the russian people which he does annually um but he talks about um the the cgi generated deep fake of himself and he actually has a conversation with his fake self to the <laughs> russian people as part of his address which is like this double kind of you know like mindfuck going on because we know that he also, you know, utilizes this technology as part of their cyber warfare campaign. But um, it's becoming just something that uh, we have to recognize and educate people on, um, especially younger people, just just to have them, you know, kind of take the blinders off and say, listen, you know, this device is going to try to market you <laughs> all of this stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, everything that you do on here, I mean, gosh, the amount of people especially kind of in a, in a cancel culture age that whose lives have been destroyed by making a stupid post when their brains aren't even fully developed i mean we're talking about people you know making mistakes when they were 15 14 18 25 i mean i'm at an age luckily to where you know social media really didn't become a thing until just as i was kind of graduating from college um but thank god because it's like how many mistakes you know do you make when you're younger and, and like now that has to be like permanently documented and we have to be accountable for all of those where where's the room for forgiveness and growth and understanding i mean the whole point you know of, of human character is about making a mistake and then learning from it and then growing from it but we're not permitting people to make mistakes in this world and so as a result it's all starting to build and that's what you just see this just ridiculous amount of of um, just vitriol that's occurring between people. And, and people don't behave like that actually in real life. You know, two people, when they argue so like they hate each other so much on these platforms, if they are face to face, you know, they're, they're, they're generally, if you're making eye contact with somebody, um, then it's a whole different thing. And, and that's one of the big breakthroughs that we learn in the film uh, is this concept called limbic resonance. And limbic resonance is when you're actually making eye contact with another human and you're in a place to where you feel safe as far as in the environment, um, you're releasing a kind of a, a flood of hormones um, that help you regulate your, you know, your, your emotions and your happiness. And we're not getting that um, because you have to be physically next to the person to actually to get that. And so 
I think that's also connected to this huge rise in, in suicides and, and, and depression, especially in, in, in teens. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing having the discernment to understand that you're talking with a real human being on a social platform versus some artificial or bot generated thing. But the other consequence you've talked about, even the mental health, I'm not convinced that the general public are aware of the general influence on their well-being, their state of mind, their emotional state. And I remember there was an experiment on Facebook where they altered the algorithm to, to bias towards negative and positive emotions in the main feed to give you a sense of... Uh, to, to, to experiment with, you know, how, how did that influence what people engage with or what they shared? And, you know, this is downright manipulation of how, how, how we live our lives. And I, I think you're absolutely right. Public education is key. But how do you get ahead of it in this time? You know, how do you stay ahead of it? But I, I agree with you. The baseline is, is that self-awareness. And your point around engaging online, you know, we've talked about this on a number of different shows here about kind of our psychological evolution in the physical realm versus our state of consciousness or psychological development in the digital world. It's almost like there's a gap between the maturity that we have in the, in the real world and the, and, and the digital maturity, because, you know, if you're in a bar in Britain here and there's an escalation of an argument, you know, a feisty landlord, she'll turf you out and the fight will get broken up and, you know, people will pull you apart and off you go. You don't get that. You don't see on a, an X feed where people are heatedly discussing. You don't see a peacemaker coming in because they'll get their head ripped off as well. Well, and, because you know, it's, it's, it's bad business for them to have situations resolved. You know, I mean, they, the, the whole, the algorithms are driven upon, um, you know, uh, very basic primal emotions, you know, like anger and envy and tribalism. And it, it really exploits those aspects of the human brain that can, is not evolving as fast as technology is, uh, or these platforms. And so it's like, you know, that dissonance right there, that is really, you know, like I said, I mean, that's, that's what's causing the majority of the escalation of these existential problems that we're, that we're facing right now. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's hard to talk about any major problem in the world right now without being able to go back to internet platforms and connecting that as, as something that's made that problem worse. Yeah. I think there's, there's, there's kind of a lack of guardrails within the platforms. There's no real sense of ethical or moral standing to my experience at least. And I'm sad to say I've grown up during a time where there's almost always been some sort of war on my television. I remember in my childhood seeing all kinds of warfare and geo geopolitical conflict. And, but there was always a, a somewhat of a safe boundary with what you would see on the television. There was always things, there was a, you would never feel like you're in the scene as such. But now on social media, that there is almost okay, there are some filters, but it feels like there's no filter. You know, you, you, you get really up close and Again, there, there could be benefits to that in, in, in helping people to realize that this is not the world we want. We want to find a way to live peacefully. But there has to be some level of traumatic response around, you know, there's such, whether it's the situation in Gaza or Ukraine, Russia, you know, we were able to see into this conflict in a way that we've never seen before. And I just, I'm concerned about the psychological impact that will have on people's lives because it's, you're literally seeing images of, you know, dead people, you know, people killed oh, in it's, conflict. It's, I mean, the, the thing about, uh, you know, when we were growing up, being able to uh, watch something on, on, you know, uh, on the news was that you can turn off the television. You didn't take the television with you. I mean, you, of course, we had radio and everything else, but, um, you know, people with staring at their phones in bed and then waking up and seeing this kind of horrific imagery that's happening. Of course, it's going to elicit really powerful emotions, and it should because it's terrible, you know, all the things that are happening right now and all these different conflicts. However, these are complex issues of which have, um, you know, histories that are centuries or millennial, millennia old. And so, you know, people need to have critical thinking in order to do, you know, really research this stuff. There's so much in literature out there that takes a lot of time. I mean, people have studied this stuff for their whole lives and still can't wrap their heads around it. So, I mean, just this instinct to immediately want to respond or think that you have the answer to a very complex um, problem. This is one of the things that this is one of the costs that we're seeing is that it's it's really impacting our ability to critically think. You know, I, ironically, I think it was Steve Jobs who said, 
how important it is to be bored, the importance of boredom, of just being able to be creative and being bored. But the device that was created, you know, by him doesn't allow anybody to be bored. And so, you know, you, if we don't, if we, if we, if we can't read a book, you know, which people really can't make it through, a lot of people can't read books anymore, you know, um, and I understand that, you know, it's, it's, it's also a time commitment for a lot of people. People feel like they're busier, but, you know, if we can't use our imagination, if we don't have this ability to um, see all the different elements of a problem or put ourselves in other people's uh, shoes, uh, it's, it's, it's not only impacting our critical thinking, but it's also impacting uh, our ability to, to empathize at a, at a deep level as necessary for these kind of resolutions to occur. Uh, yeah, and I said, the, the point, I mean, this d does tell us back to a previous point around the irony that these platforms are called social media that are supposed to connect the world. And, you know, whilst they may, you know, enables us to communicate across borders effortlessly. Unfortunately, I grew up in a time where, you know, they, I wasn't digitally native with a mobile phone. Uh, and I saw uh, one of my uh, teammates recommended I watch The West Wing because it kind of highlights some of the political, yes. political challenges of today. And it's set in 1999 and it, they were do, using beepers. And I was like, oh, the golden era pre-mobile. Um, and that year, things really started to change. Um, but now we've got generations of people who are growing up digitally native. And that's that's a term that's just been banded about without consequence. Uh, and as a result, you know, you and I have grown up in a time where we hopefully have learned how to socialize one another. But I, I would even be interested to see, you know, if I was able to track my social time since the, uh, you know, the rise of these technology types. And you know, if there's a quantitative way to manage my measure my ability to socialize how that's changed but you look at the younger generations you know are they going to lack some uh, it's already we're already shown since mobile phones people can't mem remember numbers because we used to have to remember phone numbers you know oh, yeah. and now but you know are, are younger people even going to have the same social skills you know they can they can send messages online but can can they can they connect i mean is this something you're concerned about is this something you covered within the scope of the yeah film? yeah i mean i i think the you know, I'm, I'm not a child psychologist, but I do think that, you know, I'm, you know, what I call the last of the analogs as far as, you know, we're the same generation um, and that we have a we're the bridge between the, you know, the the analog and the digital. And so we saw that happen. And now when people are being born, if they don't have the analog life to compare the digital life against, then they don't there's no way to know what life is like. And I don't think, I mean, the data already exists. We know that there's surges and loneliness and depression and anxiety and these things. It's, uh, and it's a really difficult argument to make to say, oh, it's because of this when there's so many different things that are happening at the same time. But there's clearly, you know, a correlation between the, the rise of, of use of these internet platforms and the rise of, of mental health issues. Um, especially in America. But I mean, that that is a tough argument to make, but I don't think that you have to, I just mean like scientifically, it's hard to actually say cause and effect would actually, yes. you know, how to isolate it. But at the same time, I mean, you don't have to be a sociologist to look around, you know what I mean? And just to be observant and to see things that are happening. And that's what kind of prompted this journey was that, um, you know, I travel, I've, I've traveled a lot for work over the past several decades. Um, and you know, traveling, I think, in itself used to be considered like this amazing adventure. You know, you go to a new place, you might meet somebody at the airport, have interesting conversations. Now, I think in many ways, you know, you go to some place and everyone's looking at their phone. And then yeah. you go to another place and everyone's looking at their phone. You go to the airport lounge, everyone's looking at their phone. You know, you, you go to a restaurant in a new place, everyone's looking, you know, you go to the hotel lobby. It's, it's, and so I think in some ways, the the mystery and the allure of, you know, being completely free of not having your phone of being accountable, whether you're a kid who wants to go play for a couple hours or whatever. I think that I mean, how can that not affect the development of, of people? Um, but the the consequences and the costs, um, unfortunately, we don't realize until they're too late. And that's really what the film is about, too, is, is the solutions are very complicated. But I, I don't think I think the major issue that we have is just people not understanding the basic ways that these things work. You know, I mean, people, you don't have to be a mechanic to describe to someone to understand how a car works. You basically understand how it works, you understand the, the dangers of that. And I just keep using that as an example, because every government in the world has some sense of laws when it comes to driving. Um, 
you know, except maybe in Russia where they drive pretty, pretty crazy. But in, in general, like, you know, you have to really understand, you know, the, the rules in order to protect yourself and protect other people. And so if we just apply that same logic to our use of Internet platforms, we can see that we're completely behind on that. And I think once people start to understand how these things work, then they're going to just vote for the right regulation, which, by the way, is one of the only things that's bipartisan right now, especially in the United States. People on both sides of the aisle can agree that we've got to do something about this problem. And in the past, the regulation, the big question and concern with people was, well, you know, if we don't get ahead of AI and we don't get ahead of this, then, you know, these other nations are going to beat us to it. And that's a legit, you know, argument for national security, for defense. But at the same time, it's more reason as to why we should educate our own citizenship on how these things work to protect them as well. Um, because I, th I think, you know, really what we're seeing is just is, is this lack of understanding how a single click can change the entire course of your life, you know, uh, and, and, and just the gravity the, and the gravitas of just, you know, having these powerful tools in their pocket somehow just like that all and, and wonder of just, you know, this amazement of that we take it for granted, you know, because everyone's got one there because they're ubiquitous. Now everyone's kind of like, Oh, you know, it's not a big deal, but I mean, these are really, really powerful tools and, and most people do not understand how they work. And that's why we're seeing, I think, so much um, uh, problems arising from them, and particularly the internet platforms, which, you know, we're giving them data and they're not giving us anything. And their, 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 their fuel is, is our data. Yes. I mean, I mean this is a, a, such a big issue in terms of how we evolve from here, because there is all, with technological progress comes great opportunity and great benefit. But... We're at a time in history where, you know, some of the consequences we've talked about today, some of them, if you'd thought ahead long enough, you could probably predict, you could see some of them, some are unintended, um, others may be unforeseen, some may be foreseen and ignored anyway, but for the bottom line, um, but that this, this problem escalates with almost every technological set that we look at. But the question is, you know, whose responsibility is it? You know, because the take social media, for instance, talking about regulation, you know, there's a lot of conversation around cancel culture, free speech, and there's almost this quashing now. There's this uh, regulation coming in around the world to, 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 in the name of safety, to shut down certain types of conversation. But there's nothing really about the responsibility of the user in terms of how they engage. So who's, who's responsible for how technology is used and how is, how it's created. And I think that it, my concern is with things like this, it always ends up impacting the end user rather than the manufacturers. You know, it's, 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 it's where, where, where are the ethical moral guidelines for, and where, where should, where would they come from in the modern age? You know? Yeah. Well, well, not only that, it's also impacting people disproportionately as Dr. Sophia Noble, who's wonderful. She's got a great book called algorithms of oppression and she's, uh, she's in our film. I mean, it's, the amount of discrimination um, that, that that people have um, using digital devices and internet platforms. I mean, we start learning about how this works. I mean, it's it, it's 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 really disparaging. I mean, it's 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 crazy. Uh, people actually knew, you know, digital redlining is a major thing. You know what I mean? It's it's a you know, if you're googling something and something comes up, you might not be seeing the same thing as somebody else. Well, just think about <clears throat> how that can impact every little aspect of your life. And then how those decisions can start to compound. Um, I mean, this is it, it's quite a, a, a growing a growing problem. And if you compare that to the people who actually are creating the technology in Silicon Valley, <clears throat> you'll see the schools that exist in these areas, and a lot of them are tech-free schools. So you know, do you ever wonder why people who create these internet platforms, in many cases, don't let their own children use those? creations. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, why? What do they know that, that the, the consumers don't know? And we're starting to, to learn that. <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm, I'm not a Luddite. I don't think that we should, you know, <clears throat> not use cell phones and not use these internet platforms. It's not the, the point of the film. I just, I think it's more about just being aware of how they work, just like other tools in our society and, and keeping up with those advancements to the best of our ability. And, um, and certainly voting 
uh, in the direction of uh, protecting the citizenship. Yeah. Now, I mean, there's a couple of points I'd like to draw on there. So Roger uh, McNamee, who's in the film, he's an interesting example to me. Um, You know, he's made a career for managing technology funds. He's heavily invested in technology and media and social media, early investor in Google, Facebook, um, you know, holds patents in these types of technologies. Yet, you know, since at least 2017, he's been very outspoken about the darker side of social media, uh, you know, warning us not to trust technology companies and some of the companies he's even invested in. So how, how, how does he square that up? And, you know, having worked with him on a number of projects. Um, because I, I asked him about that in the film. I said, you know, do you have any guilt or accountability for it? And that's that's part of the film you have to watch in order to, you know, um, to see how we lead up to that. But um, he wrote a great book called Desucked. Uh, which I read, you know, as research going into this before I even realized that I was going to be interviewing him. Um, but uh, I think he he kept writing. Uh, I mean, you can read his book to figure out exactly his his uh, his growth pattern. But he was started writing letters to uh, Zuckerberg personally, um, and then to the board, and then to saying, "Listen, I'm concerned about this, guys." And then he realized that they just, you know, that they understood this information and they weren't going to change how um how the intricacies of the of this worked and um the structure of their business model and um he's dedicated the rest of his life to becoming an activist uh and i mean i I think that's that's the best case example of someone who's made a tremendous amount of um of money for himself and for other people and then to kind of divest from that opportunity and then to um, start to raise awareness about its harms um I mean, it's um, it's 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 a a classic story of you know Icarus flying too close to the sun, you know. I mean, how far do we want to push these things before it ends up burning us, you know, as a culture and as a civilization? And I think we're starting to you know play with fire right now. Mm, that, I agree, with that. and that's the existential part. You know, for me, this does come with existential risk. The new technology sets that are emerging, unchained technology. This, you know, it's. It's it's almost like the Wild West, but just on steroids. It's 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 the Wild West of technology. Now you mentioned um, you touched on solutions. You know, it is and interestingly, people of my generation, you know, we, we were the Facebook generation, but a lot of my close friends have you know they're no longer using these platforms. They haven't necessarily deleted their account, but their usage has dramatically dwindled. It has your own behavior with technology? Obviously, you and I are completely reliant on technology to for our work. You know, it's it's not that oh, we're yeah, yeah. against technology. <clears throat> At least I mean that assumption. You know, but but how how has your own uh, relationship with technology changed since the the creation of this? I uh, I have a, a a daughter who's eight, and um, I have become much more cognizant of of my use of my phone when, um, when I'm around her, it's, it's cause kind of casually you start on your phone. If you're around, that's, you're not giving full attention. You know, if you're, if you're doing something on your phone, there's always a reason to be doing that. And that's challenging. It's not easy. I mean, especially if it's in the middle of a, you know, of, of a work day, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I don't have a typical kind of career. So there's, you know, I'm, I'm typically am at the mercy it does feel like sometimes I'm at the mercy of my phone. What I do try to do is, um, Apple, you know, on iPhones, you can check the amount of screen time that you have, and now they can start to divide the amount of kind of the what kind of screen time you're doing, if you're on social or if it's, you know, productivity or whatever. Um, I do delete apps if I feel like I'm starting to abuse them. Um, I used to post a lot, like on Instagram, for whatever reason, I think I'm the generation that uses that platform, uh, or it's kind of the one that most of my my colleagues and my friends are on, but I, I don't do it as often, and especially because I kind of feel like if I have it on my phone, I'd start scrolling, and before you know it, an hour has gone by, and you're kind of like, what, where did that hour go? And then you start thinking about, um, you know, what could you have done with that time instead? And I think as, as you get older, you know, you don't have the, the, the luxury of as much time as when you're younger, or you don't value time the same way. And 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 uh, I think that's, that's just me becoming more aware of, and so I end up deleting something or reinstalling it when I need it. And I've been doing that a lot. Um, you know, it, I will use an app and if I, whatever it might be, if I feel like it's no longer healthy, I will just delete it from my phone because you can always reinstall. It takes, you know, a minute to reinstall an app. Um, as far as everything from Google Docs to everything else, I mean, I use all of those things regularly. Um, I have experimented with DuckDuckGo versus Google in some cases. But um, uh, once again, I, I, I think a, a big point in the movie is that as individuals, 
you know, our individual behavior is not going to solve the problem. You know, it's we're, we're talking about these these huge, um, massive corporations. Um, and it's more about as, uh, as, as as citizens, us being able to being woken up to what's happening and coming together and uh, inspire change. I mean, ultimately, like I said, this is already an issue that's bipartisan um, in the United States, at least. Uh, I think the EU is a little bit more ahead of the game than than we are on this as far as digital privacy and protections. Um, but uh, once people understand, especially parents, once people understand how it's impacting, you know, their their, their kids, I think there's kind of a, a natural instinct that's that's that comes over. But the problem is people just aren't aware of it because there's this massive campaign uh, talking about how great all this stuff is all the time. And once again. It is great. There's lots of great stuff that's out there. I mean, AI is fantastic for, I'm going to document you right now about longevity. And it's amazing to learn about how AI is, is with gene therapy and these other elements that are coming together for this huge revolution in biotech and in aging research. But that doesn't mean that, you know, two things can't be true at the same time. And that's why it's important to have critical thinking, to be able to say both things can be true. And that's what we're that's what our problem is, is this stuff is is pushing our brains in one direction or the other instead of allowing us to have, you know, to, to think critically about how these issues are impacting both aspects of, of how we live. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, those other, I mean, that sounds like a fascinating film as well. And, and those technology areas, I have the exact same concerns. I don't know which technology type has great existential risk, whether it's AI or gene therapy because you, you, again with either either however you look at it the you know initial benefits you know we had the benefits of social media etc it's all the unintended consequences that emerge that particularly when you center in upon the driving factor which is the commercialization of these technologies and how that has a very strong way of overlooking those consequences um you know, the social issues we've been talking about today, the social platforms, they're reliant upon our data. You know, there was a time, again, looking back to the days of analog, which we've touched about, you know, even harking back to a, a different era, but, you know, you, you could opt out of the phone book to have your phone number removed. Yeah. You could write to a company and say, delete my, uh, you know, they'd have to send you what, what details yeah. they have on you and you can opt out. Now, you know, how many companies have your email address? How many companies have your phone number? How many companies have bought your data? How many, you know, it's... There is no way for me as a user, and again, that term user is just, you know, talking about social addiction, you know, it's customer, client. There's no way of me finding out a single touch of a button, which companies have my data, what data they have, how they're using it, how they're monetizing it. And that to me is a flaw. And I think that's an opportunity because I think in a decentralized world that's emerging, the opportunity to have a tool where I can physically at the touch of a button opt out and just turn off, turn off the ability for these companies to use my data in the way they do. That to me would be putting the power back in the hands of the people because at the moment it's un unlimited what these companies can do. They can sell your data without consent, even if it's anonymized or randomized. It's still utilizing your personal information without your consent to advance their own aims, which as we've talked about throughout this session is that they're not aligned with societal outcomes. So to well, me, the privacy part yeah. of this is so significant. Yeah, and, and Carissa Valise is somebody to follow on um, on on X, um, and someone to read her book "Privacy is, is Power" because she's really an expert on what we can do to you know to to get a grip on on the data privacy aspect of things. Uh, another thing that is um, I think important for people to realize is not just a transfer of data; it's a transfer of wealth. Um, you know, we're as as Roger says in the movie. You know, you you're not allowed to sell your organs. You're not allowed to sell your body parts and your data is part of you. And yet we're giving that away to somebody else for free only because we're not aware of the value of that. And so most of us aren't rather. And so as a result, you know, these companies are becoming, you know, we're gonna have the first trillion dollar tech company here at some point soon, if not already, I think, I think Apple might be close or whatever, but um, it's data is a, is, is a major part of um, technology, especially AI. I mean, it is the fuel for, um, artificial intelligence to learn. And so, you know, I, th I think there needs to be some kind of uh, uh, better monetization process of data as well. Like, for example, if you want to share your data, fine. But, you know, you should be getting something out of that. That's not just the, you know, a check mark. If that company is building their technology around the data that you're providing and just 
not knowing how these different dynamics work has been deliberate. You know, they don't want people to understand, you know, how, how these things work uh, for, for many reasons. And now I think that, you know, the, that there's more political pressure um, and legal pressure for them to change. Hopefully we're on a good path, uh, on, on a good path for that, for sure. But um, uh, I just think most people just need to self-educate. I think that's the most immediate thing that people can do. Yes, I would, I would like to close, David, by kind of asking, you know, do you see somewhat of a counterculture revolution emerging amongst younger generations who reject this type of uh, techno feed? You know, do, do you see some do you see some sort of pushback from the younger generations against these things? Because your work examines culture. But do you think there is a counterculture that could emerge oh, from yeah. this? Yeah, I think we're already seeing, um, you know, huge signs of this in America right now. Um, the, the coolest clubs to go to in comedy are ones to where you have to take your cell phone, put them in a plastic bag and give them to somebody to check them in because the idea of, of filming a concert, number one, or a show, you're not fully in the moment. And then number two, um, people are not going to behave the same because, um, you don't behave the same as when you know you're under surveillance. It's like, you know, if we know that we're being watched by another animal that is we're prey and they're a predator. It's just, it's, it's in our brains. It's embedded there. We don't behave the same way. Um, and so I think you're starting to see people realize that they're missing something, but they don't know what they're missing. And if they grew up digital natives, they don't understand what that's like not to be digital natives. You're seeing a huge surge in people that want to go to national parks that want to spend more time outside um, because they're not getting enough of that on a regular basis. Um, I think you're also seeing signs of this um, in there's lots of major cities, including New York, to where, uh, you know, there's restaurants that are detox cafes to where you're not allowed to put your phones on the table. Uh, you're seeing uh, huge surges of what are called death cafes in London, which is uh, people having serious conversations about life and death uh, mm. with no technology and going to these places, just this human curiosity and this idea of using our imaginations and to have real conversations with people, um, it's needed. It's needed for, for us to feel fully human. And so we might not understand exactly why people are feeling like something's missing, but I, I think that we're, it's, it's, you know, it's not, we, we can't change what it means to be human, at least right away. And so people are starting to find ways to experience that in one or another. Absolutely. Now, I, w I want to close up by giving people the opportunity to find out about where to find the film uh, and your wider work. You know, you, you've mentioned a couple of other pieces of work within the conversation, you know, founder of the Culture Net. Do you want to do you want to share the, the links to sure. both uh, your projects? Uh, Cost of convenience dot film is where you can um, learn more about the film, uh, release dates, uh, screenings, um, streaming available, etc. Uh, that's where you can learn about the film. Uh, my other work, uh, Maestro, Nordic Pulse and Forte. Uh, are all focused on the world of classical music, but from a uh, kind of a, a, a unique perspective um, are available on all major platforms globally, um, Amazon, um, Apple TV, et cetera. So. Amazing. Thank you, David. This has been an illuminating yeah, conversation. Yeah, thank you so much and, for having me. Yeah, an incredible piece of work you put together and it's thank such you. an important one at this time, uh, this unique junction. I think we are at a junction, you know, where we head from here is 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 in our hands and we have to find a path forward that, that, that learns from the past and helps us to shape a future without you know, without losing the benefits that are available from technology, but find a way to use it responsibly. And I think the, the, the power is in our hands to create change. So thank you very much, David, uh, for, for your work. And I really appreciate you being here on the Free Human. Yeah, Podcast. thanks for the conversation. I very much enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.